All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are locked on Falcons. I'm your host, Aaron Freeman. And today we are talking about the Falcons having several players visit and how much stock we should be putting in their interest in these prospects, as well as talking about a recent special teams and secondary signing and answering some leftover listener questions, including one about the potential for the Falcons to still upgrade their left guard position in free agency. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So, guys, you know me. I'm Aaron Freeman. been covering the Falcons for many years, formerly at FalcFans.com. RIP still going strong on Twitter, at FalcFans. And, of course, the host of this preeminent Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, right here on the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family. And, guys, I want to thank everyone that makes Locked On Falcons their first listen each and every day. And, of course, Locked On Falcons is free and available on a variety of podcast platforms including Apple, Odyssey, Google, Spotify, and of course on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the Locked On Falcons YouTube channel and you'll get uh, the video version of the episode the night before you get the audio version of the episode. So today we're going to start off talking a little bit about the Falcons um, holding their local pro day on Monday, uh, which for those of you that don't know, aren't familiar with what that means is basically, I don't know exact parameters, but Basically, if you've gone to high school or college within like a 200 and I don't know, 50 mile radius of Atlanta, then the Falcons can invite you to their local pro day, which is basically a, essentially a pro day for all these local prospects at multiple positions where they can bring all these guys to their facility. They can run them through drills. They can do all the various things that you could do uh, at a pro day. And it's a really great opportunity you know, obviously the big names at Georgia or whatever, Georgia Tech or some of the local high school phenoms, the four or five star guys that, you know, spread out throughout the SEC and elsewhere in the nation. You know, it may not be as sort of a, an opportunity for those guys to showcase their athleticism or their ability to work because they've gone to the senior bowl. They've gone to other all star games, a combine, et cetera, and they've had their own pro days. It's really more for those guys, an opportunity to get in the building and the Falcons brass to sort of pick their brain but for some of those smaller school guys the guys from georgia state the guys from georgia southern you know if they can prevent those people from fighting about you know who's the real gsu in the building you know it's an opportunity for those guys valdosta state you know all these various schools albany state whatever uh that you know these guys that uh don't necessarily have the opportunities that some of these bigger school guys have maybe some of these local high school products that you know, like TJ Yates once upon a time uh, was a local pro day invite or whatever the case may be. Uh, I think Ty Taylor Heineke was maybe not TJ Yates, but TJ Yates would have been eligible. But I, I can't recall if he was actually there. Uh, but Taylor Heineke, I, I recall, I think because I think he's from Atlanta as well, uh, was a local pro day invite or whatever. And, and this is a really opportunity for some of these guys, particularly that are undrafted free agents to get on the Falcons radar and showcase what they have. Um, and so that's a really golden opportunity. Some of the sort of bigger name guys that are getting these sort of top 30 visits and top 30 visits refer to sort of you get 30 players that you can bring into your building and, and go through the whole sort of rigmarole of like bringing them into your building, watching film and doing all these various things. And some of the players that have been reported to have those visits are UCLA tight end Greg Dulcich, Clemson cornerback Andrew Booth, quarterback from UNC Sam Howell, supposed to have one later this week. Uh, I know that uh, Western Kentucky edge rusher D'Angelo Malone and Kentucky safety use of Corker were also in the Falcons building. I don't know if those were top 30 visits or because those guys are also Atlanta natives or uh, local to Atlanta, um, whether that was part of the pro day or whatever the case may be. So, you know, this is a usual observation. And in past years, Falcon fans and, and uh, various other people have sort of focus honed in on these guys that the Falcons bring into the building as if they're sort of getting a glimpse at their draft board. But all of that to sit here and say is like, I don't know how much stock we should be putting into these visits 
to indicate anything about what the who the Falcons are interested. In. Obviously, you're not going to bring a player in if you don't have any interest into him. But given what we know about this regime and how they sort of are very reluctant to put any type of information to the point that they won't even give you injury updates uh, on their various players, the idea that we're sort of going to read into these visits and say like these are the guys that the Falcons want I would be hesitant to read too much into that and that's sort of a carryover from the previous regime where they would sort of tip their hand to a certain extent with some of these player visits although over time that was not the case like I remember very early on when Dan Quinn used to be very active on Twitter uh, in his early days he would actually like tweet out the photos of the various schools that the Falcons were traveling to to do their sort of on-campus workouts uh, very early on in those first like few off seasons that he was there, that kind of stopped around 2017 um, because they started realizing, okay, we need to not put out a lot of this information. And I, like, I remember very distinctly back in 2019 draft that someone had told me, you know, sources, as they say, um, you know, someone had told me that the Falcons were interested in, in Cody Ford, but they had also sort of told me that they were trying to keep it hush hush in their interest in Cody Ford, the Oklahoma offensive tackle. Um, and, and then I remember like, I think it was like two days later, like Von McClure, the late great Von McClure of ESPN sort of put it out there. And I was like, Oh, the cat's out of the bag. And so like at that time I didn't put it on my Falcons draft interest tracker that used to run on falfans.com at the time until Vaughn put it out there. And I'm like, okay, now I could put it out there. Um, but that was sort of the first indicator I remember and that kind of led to how I was able to successfully and accurately predict the Falcons taking AJ Terrell the next year, because it was very interesting to me that the Falcons didn't show any sort of, you know, reported interest in AJ Terrell, even though he checked all the boxes that you would typically think of Falcons, you know, the, the Falcons would want in a cornerback. And so I was like, aha, like, and so that, that Cody Ford moment was like the first moment where I was like, oh, they're purposefully trying to hide the fact that they are showing interest, which was a, a sea change from what they did before. So, you know, all I have to sit here and say is like, even the old regime where we put a lot of stock in that, we had to put less stock in that. And I think this regime, we probably should put a lot less stock in it. So we'll just sort of have to see how this draft plays out. If we wind up drafting a couple of these guys, uh, you know, when all is said and done, then we can sort of retroactively say, oh, that was a lot more meaningful than we, or at least I said it was. But un until we see that kind of happen, I would probably, you know, it's interesting, but I wouldn't necessarily pay too much close attention. That's part of the reason why, like, you're not going to hear on Lockdown Falcons, oh, the Falcons brought this player in for a visit. What does that mean? And, and, and all these various things, like, we're probably not going to follow that too closely. Now, if, if something weird happens, then maybe we might, you know, talk about it on a podcast. But for the most part, right, you know, if, but, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a heads up. Like, if we're talking about that, that means I have nothing else to talk about. Uh, on the day. So just want to give you a heads up on that. But we'll continue today's episode talking a little bit about a free agent signing that the Falcons did over the weekend uh, in getting cornerback Mike Ford and what his potential role in Atlanta could be, how that may influence um, their draft decision making, as well as maybe the future of some current Falcons that may be on the roster bubble headed into this offseason. And we'll get into that as we continue today's Locked On Falcons podcast. But before we get there, guys, I want to remind you that Locked On Falcons is part of the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family. You're getting the local coverage that you always love and get from Locked On Falcons, Locked On Hawks, Locked On Braves, Locked On Bulldogs, but you're also getting three new shows on the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast page that you can find on all the same podcast platforms that you find all your other local shows. You're getting A to Z with Mark Zeno. You're getting Hitting Hard with John Chuckery and ATL Day Ones with Jarvis Davis and Tanisha Batiste. You know and love all these folks from their days at 680 The Fan and 92.9 The Game, and now they're here on the Locked On Podcast Network. So check out all three shows. Find your favorite on the same podcast platforms that you find Locked On Falcons, including on YouTube. Guys, baseball is back, and you want to get in on that action by heading over to betonline.net, the number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. You can find podcasts, the latest odds, contests, player props, you name it. BetOnline has it all. And it's not just Major League Baseball because BetOnline has you covered for the NBA, the boxing, UFC, golf, hockey, esports, and even your favorite Vegas casino games. And you know they got you covered for your 2022 NFL draft props. So whether you want to bet on 
Malik Willis going to the Saints, the Panthers, the Falcons, the Steelers, or some other team, you can bet on that at betonline.net. You can bet who you think is going to be the first pick. You can bet on who you think is going to win the Super Bowl this year. You can bet on all those things by heading over to the website at betonline.net. Use your mobile device to sign up and learn more about the trends in action. Bet online where the game starts. So the Falcons did sign a player on Friday. So let's talk a little bit about Mike Ford, the ex-Lions cornerback. And my expectation is Ford was signed primarily to compete for a back-end depth role and primarily to potentially fill a special teams role. Uh, he was primarily a special teams player in Detroit, worked as a gunner uh, in Detroit for a couple of seasons that overlapped with when Falcons special teams coordinator coordinator Marquise Williams, current Falcons special teams coordinator Marquise Williams was an assistant there. Um, Ford was most recently with the Broncos in 2021, but he spent three years prior to that with the Lions. And I imagine, you know, Ford is probably going to be, I wouldn't say a front runner, but one of the prime candidates to win one of those gunner spots um, on the punt coverage team. You know, last year, that was a role primarily filled by guys like Kendall Sheffield and Avery Williams and and Frank Darby. Uh, and so, you know, I would imagine Avery Williams would be one guy and then sort of that other spot opposite him would be open to competition. Um, I don't necessarily expect Ford to uh, compete too much on defense. I don't think that's primarily what he's uh, going to be asked to do across four seasons in the NFL. He's played about 550 career snaps on defense and his coverage metrics according to pro football focus aren't particularly promising some of his numbers are sort of comparable to what we saw from tj green in a much smaller sample a year ago in terms of how many yards he's given up how many completions he's given up those sorts of things so i wouldn't necessarily expect uh, a scenario where mike ford based off of what we've seen so far in his nfl career if he's getting significant snaps on defense that's usually probably not a, a promising side so He's been primarily used as an outside corner, although he has some experience playing in the slot. So my guess is that he's going to be sort of competing for that CB6 role. If you assume the top five corners on the roster that are all, again, I wouldn't call all of these guys locks, but should be relatively safe uh, with AJ Terrell, Casey Hayward, Isaiah Oliver, Darren Hall, and, and Avery Williams sort of being the top five corners. And so you imagine the six cornerback spot, if the Falcons choose to keep that guy, will primarily be a special teams role. And that's where guys like Ford and Kendall Sheffield, who, you know, frankly, I'm a little surprised is still on the team at this point in time. But essentially, this is the role that Sheffield had a year ago, which is a guy that rarely played on defense, but primarily played on special teams. D. Alford was another guy that the Falcons brought in this offseason. They brought in from the CFL to compete for that role. Lafayette Pitts was on the practice squad last year, former Pitt alum. Corey Ballantyne also spent some time on the practice squad. I think Cornell Armstrong was also on the practice squad. So all of these guys potentially are in the mix for that CB6 role and, and sort of who has the best camp is going to be the guy that ultimately wins that role. Um, you know, but I think Ford's experience on special teams and his familiarity with the coaching staff potentially could give him a leg up and make him potentially the front runner for that CB6 role. Um, but because the Falcons have so many current options on their roster at cornerback, it does make me a little bit skeptical that the team may wind up drafting a cornerback this year. Um, but, you know, because they're a best player available team. Uh, in terms of their, you know, stated philosophy, we'll see if they live up to those standards in this year's draft. Um, you know, they could still take a cornerback with the idea um, that that guy could come in and be the sixth corner. But yeah, it, it doesn't seem likely. You know, I wouldn't completely rule out the possibility of using an early round pick on a corner, but I would be, I would be, I would doubt it, right? But if they do use a pick on a corner, it's probably, if I was to guess, again, this is a guess it's probably going to be like a day three guy that can come in and kind of do what we're talking about Mike Ford doing. And some of these other guys come and do somebody that will come in and primarily be a special teams guy can be a gunner, can add some speed to the roster and basically, you know, be the next Kendall Sheffield. If that's not a player like Ford or Alford or Armstrong or Ballantyne or Pitts or whatever the case may be. So we'll see about that. So uh, before we continue to, uh, uh, wrap up today's episode answering some listener questions. We got a couple on the offensive line. We got one 
about the quarterback position. We got two actually about the quarterback position uh, because they come from a, a pair of listeners that are similar veins, or at least I will try to answer them in one fell swoop. Uh, but the first one comes from Stephen A. He mentions a he links to me a, a Yahoo article that they mentioned the Falcons being in the Baker Mayfield sweepstakes, assuming the Browns cover 80% of the salary. If you're Terry Fontenot, do you pull the trigger? I figure that provides us a cheap depth, and I don't believe anyone in the NFL intentionally tries to lose despite what fans claim they want. And then Greg E. asks a, a comparable question. What are your thoughts on potentially trading for Baltimore's backup quarterback, Tyler Huntley? So, Again, I'll answer this in sort of one answer, and I don't get these questions, guys. I didn't really understand these questions like six months ago when people were asking about like reclamation projects and all these, you know, backup bridge quarterbacks, you know, when Matt Ryan was here. And now that especially now that Matt Ryan is not here, I, I don't understand why we're looking at other quarterback options that aren't in the draft. Right. The number one priority for this football team moving forward is to find their next franchise quarterback. And I, you know, unless you guys have a very different opinion of Baker Mayfield or Tyler Huntley than I do, and seemingly the rest of the world does, um, I don't think those guys are going to be your franchise quarterback. So the Falcons, you know, shouldn't be really in the market for a bridge quarterback. They have that in Marcus Mariota. Frankly, Matt Ryan was a bridge quarterback, much to the chagrin of a lot of Fa Falcon fans that constantly were arguing with me about that notion. Um, but, you know, that ultimately proved true. He was a very expensive and, and nice looking bridge. But essentially he was, you know, the Alex Smith and eventually the Falcons were going to find their Patrick Mahomes. That was the stated goal by this regime from the jump. And so, like, adding more bridge quarterbacks, adding more, you know, veteran depth reclamation projects like a, a, a Baker Mayfield or whatever case, just to me, just doesn't make any sense at this point. There's no point to that, you know, it, whether, you know we draft a quarterback this year or next year or whatever case may be, it should be clear on everybody's mind that, you know, we're going to find, we're going to try attempt to find our franchise quarterback in the draft at some point in the next, what, 13 months, right? That's the stated goal. I, I don't think there's in, in any resources and assets used that isn't on the, on the quarterback position that isn't with that intention, it's just kind of a, a waste of, of resources and assets right now is, is my opinion. So, you know, Greg, Steven, you know, anybody else out there that's like, what about this not quarterback? You know, what about this quarterback that isn't, you know, one of the top six quarterbacks in this year's draft class or presumably, you know, who are the top five or six quarterbacks in next year's draft class, you know, as, as potential Falcons, I'm just going to sit here and go like, what's the point? I don't get it. Um, so uh, speaking of, you know, Mayfield, we talked about Baker. Let's talk about another Mayfield and Jalen and the possibility of the Falcons replacing him as well as whether or not Jermaine Effetti can kind of be the new Matt Gano and sort of how he plays a part in that conversation. And we'll get into that as we continue today's Locked on Falcons answering some of your listener questions. But before we get there, guys, I want to give you a heads up that, uh, you know, the Locked on Network is going to be covering the draft better than anybody else beginning on April 28th on Thursday night with their live coverage, three days of extensive coverage featuring experts and insiders like me. Um, and, you know, for those of you that are also, you know, big fans of the uh, Locked On Ultimate Mock Draft that we do every single year, that will be dropping next Monday, the first round, uh, the first picks, I should say, um, of that mock draft begin on April 20 or April 18th and run through the 22nd. I think there'll also be some follow up picks in round two on the following Monday as well. So that's always a big week long extravaganza. Of course, you can subscribe and search for Ultimate Mock Draft to get subscribed to that for the audio version. Of course, you can see video versions of that. So definitely Locked On is going to have that extensive wall to wall coverage, starting with the Ultimate Mock Draft next week. And then, of course, continuing with three days of um, lots of great coverage, uh, you know, featuring, you know, smart, intelligent, handsome, you know, daily podcast listeners like yours truly and whatnot. So definitely check that out on your preferred podcast platform. And of course, you can find the live show on Locked On NFL Drafts YouTube page. Um, and uh, also, guys, I want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With ever increasing numbers of makes and models, it's 
now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why wait while the person behind the counter orders parts on their computer when you already have a computer with rock with access to rockauto.com at home or in your pocket? Save time and money when using Rock Auto instead of spending up to twice as much for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership. Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years with reliably low prices for every single customer. They have everything you need from brake parts to tail lamps, motor oil, even new carpet. Go to rockauto.com and browse their easy-to-use website, and you can see all the parts available for your car or truck. And then when you do, write Locked On in the How Did You Hear About Us box so that they know we sent you Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. So we got a couple of other questions from Greg E., who just asked about Tyler Huntley. Um, His next questions come uh, about Nick Easton. Do you think Nick Easton would be a competent solution since we brought him in for a visit already? Or who else do you think would make a better choice? And then his second question is, how would you compare Jermaine Effetti to Matt Gano as a player? Could he fill a similar role? So uh, Nick Easton was a player that we did bring in for a visit earlier this offseason in the opening days of free agency. Um, until recently, the Falcons had brought in guys and then immediately signed them like within 24 hours. We did get a little bit of a delay between the Jermaine Effetti workout and visit and Rashawn Evans as well, but before they officially signed, um, you know, I, I can't remember exact timeline, but it felt like it was maybe like five or six days. Um, you know, I think Easton, I, my recollection, I'm going off the top of my head, but he like worked out like on the 18th. So, you know, we're almost coming up on a month. So I think it's probably unlikely uh, that the Falcons are going to bring in Nick Easton, but we did talk about Nick Easton last January when it first sort of came up on the podcast that the Falcons could sign him as a bridge slash placeholder at the left guard position until they found someone better in the draft, um, which, you know, we can discuss if they did. But, um, you know, the thing that Easton brings to the table is the versatility to play more both center and guard. He's probably more naturally a center just because he's not necessarily a guy that you like in one-on-one pass protection situations that you would face more often at guard, similar to what, uh, we talked about in the past when Bing Garland uh, was the Falcons, you know, backup, and he was probably a better center than a guard. Um, but uh, you know, you know, I wouldn't look at Easton as an ideal starter, but neither is uh, Jalen Mayfield at this point. And you know, as I often say on this podcast, beggars can't be choosers. And if we ever do, you know, launch some merch here on Locked On Falcons, you'll probably be able to get a T-shirt that says, you know, beggars can't be choosers. Uh, you know, quoted by Aaron Freeman every single day on the Lockdown Falcons podcast. Uh, so, you know, look forward to that at some future date. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think if the Falcons are going to address the left guard position bef- between now and the draft, you know, um, or after the draft, you know, there's no rush at this point in time because it's not as if, you know, the Falcons are looking to draft a left guard at the top of the draft. So there's no rush in that regard. Um you know, I think there are some veteran options that I think are probably better options than Nick Easton. And of course, obviously, if you, you listen to this podcast, you, you know, I think are probably better options than Jalen Mayfield at this point. There's three I would stand. I would point out Quentin Spain, who was the starting left guard for the Bengals this past year, but also spent some time starting at left guard in Tennessee when Arthur Smith was there. You have Ode Abushi, who was a teammate with TJ Yates, the Falcons latest wide receiver coach. Uh, as well as their passing game specialist or whatever he was last year. And partially we, we can, we haven't really discussed that aspect, but probably was a contributing factor to the team's interest in Deshaun Watson, uh, given their relationship that goes back years and years from their shared days in Houston. Um, but, you know, Ode Abushi was a uh, guard for the Texans several years ago when TJ Yates was the quarterback back then uh, played in their outside zone scheme, I think in the final years of Arian Foster there. So he fits there has played both left and right guard uh, and been sort of a journeyman player bouncing around the league several, with several different teams over the last couple of years. Um, David Questenberry, I think was a teammate of those guys in Houston as well and played guard in Houston. And then most recently uh, these last couple of years was a backup right tackle um, for the Titans and started this past year at right tackle for that team. And I think I could be misremembering this, but was one of the top graded run blockers 
at that right tackle position this past year, even though his pass protection was very suspect. So he's like the more extreme version of Caleb McGarry, good run blocker or a great run blocker based off his PFF grades and poor pass protector. But, you know, maybe you move him in the left guard where he started out his career um, and maybe that mitigates some of the pass protection issues and you still get the value in the run game that you're looking for. And all those guys are on the quote unquote wrong side of 30. So you're only looking at them as one year stop gaps, but potentially they, they get you through the year with competent caliber starting play over Mayfield, or at the very least they can be brought in to compete with Mayfield and push Mayfield similar to how you brought in a Fetty to push Caleb McGarry. And speaking of a Fetty, um, as he compares to Matt Gano, you know, I don't quite know because I haven't done a deep dive on Fetty's film. I've seen a little bit of him from his days in Chicago. And of course, I can recall, you know, some very lackluster days in Seattle. Um, but the main reason why I haven't been able to do a deep dive is, you know, Game Pass continues to be garbage. Uh, it used to be that it was very convenient where you could do a quick, you know, you could bang out film quickly because I, if I was basically like, oh, I could want to see all Jim Rain Fetty's run blocking snaps and see how he is as a run blocker. So I could just quickly go into game pass search for all the bears run plays in, in certain games. And I could just quickly bang out those film or do the same thing with the pass protection, but you can't do that anymore with game pass. And so it makes it really hard. It's, it's like a whole ordeal to watch film. Cause you have to watch every single snap of a game just to watch some film. Um, but you know, that's, that's a me problem, not necessarily a you problem, but I always like to vent, you know, I need something to complain about. And I'm trying not to complain about Jalen Mayfield. So let's complain about Game Pass on this podcast. But, you know, I think from what Fetty is expected to bring to the table for the Falcons, you know, we talked about this before when we signed him on our, uh, on episode last week, uh, that the fact that his experience is extensively on the right side of the offensive line at right guard and right tackle going back to his college days, that differs from what Matt Gano was. Matt Gano was primarily left tackle in college, then came to Atlanta obviously got worked at both left and right tackle as the team's swing tackle in his early days also got some extensive work at guard uh towards the end of his career so had a little bit more versatility to play multiple roles and on both sides of the line and that matters because in a world where Afedi and McGarry are competing for the starting right tackle spot as i expect to be the case the loser isn't necessarily automatically penciled in to be the swing tackle because in the case of both Afedi and McGarry they don't have any experience, at least dating back to high school or to college, playing on the left side of the offensive line. And you want your swing tackle to be able to plug and play, you know, in the event of an injury to not only your right tackle, but also in the event of an injury to your left tackle and Jake Matthews and a guy that's, you know, comfortable playing it. So it's certainly possible, and if not probable, that we will see the Falcons try to, you know, get some work between Afedi and McGarry at left tackle and, and see how they handle that. But it would not shock me at all if Elijah Wilkinson, even though he's probably fourth on the depth chart, actually winds up being the swing tackle for the team moving forward. And he's more the guy that's going to fill that role as the primary backup uh, that Matt Gano filled in, in the past couple of years, because Wilkinson does have that experience playing not only left tackle, but right tackle, I think right guard as well as left guard. So he has do, does have experience at all four offensive line positions, although he's primarily been a right tackle in the league. And so you do wonder at the loser of that McGarry Fetty battle, as I've mentioned before in the podcast, that because they're both quote unquote limited to only being right tackles only, although of course Fetty has guard experience, but obviously the Falcons aren't necessarily hurting for a right guard at this point in time. Uh, but we'll see, you know, you never know, uh, you know, not, I don't, that made it sound like I'm thinking Chris Lindstrom's going somewhere. I don't think Chris Lindstrom's going somewhere, but you do need depth. So that's, that's what I meant by we'll see. Um, but like you do wonder, like in the event that one of those guys loses that competition, do they become trade bait at the end of the summer? Right. Do you try to swap them for, you know, um, you know, an, a player or a late round draft pick in next year's draft or whatever the case may be, just because they don't have that positional versatility that you're looking for in a backup. Right. So that's something worth keeping an eye on. So we'll see how that develops. Uh, we got another question from Javoski Dickey at Tizzle 28 J on Twitter. Yes. What do you think the Falcons will do in the first round trade up or get trade up to get Malik Willis or stay put at eight? So I don't think the Falcons are trading up for Malik Willis. You know, I, I know that there's still a lot of people that, you know, continually mock Malik Willis to go to number two overall to the lions. I, I, I haven't really come across anybody that covers the lions um, that 
considers that to be a serious option for the Lions. Um, you know, they're going to take a pass rush. They're going to take Trayvon Walker, Aiden Hutchinson is seemingly what they're going to do with that pick. So if Willis comes off the board, the earliest it's going to be is to Carolina at number six. Um, and, you know, it seems like most people that cover the NFL, most people that are plugged into the NFL seem to think that Kenny Pickett is the more likely of the two to get picked there. Um, and that's due to the fact that Kenny Pickett has a longstanding relationship with Matt Rule, dating back to his high school days when he initially committed to Temple when Matt Rule was the head coach there uh, before ultimately deciding to go to Pitt, uh, much to my joy. And the fact that the Panthers owner, David Tepper, is a Pitt alum and booster. Uh, so you, you would imagine arguably the two highest decision makers in that organization uh, would seemingly have relationships and connections that go deep with, with Kenny Pickett. So that's why you you hear a lot of people um, and you'll continue to hear a lot of people thinking that the Panthers will go pick it uh, at six. But let's say, you know, the Panthers decide that it's a similar dynamic as what we saw last year, that Kenny Pickett is Mac Jones and uh, Malik Willis is Trey Lance. And we remember this debate that we had after the 49ers pulled off that trade. It's like, how can you trade up and then take Mac Jones? It's a similar situation, potentially, you can argue, with the Panthers. Like, how can you take a quarterback here and settle for, you know, Kenny Pickett, who has the lower ceiling than, say, a Malik Willis? Certainly a, a worthwhile conversation, and I'll leave Locked on Panthers to having that conversation. But, you know, I think it seems like it's probably a 60% chance that Pickett's the pick at six. Um, and, but let's say it's a 50-50. It's still a coin toss, and the Panthers are still figuring it out. All that to sit here and say, I think there's a that basically means there's a 50% chance that Malik Willis is going to be there at eight. So I, I think the Falcons are going to be able to stay put at eight and still potentially there's a, basically I'm saying there's a pretty good probability that they could stay put at eight and get Malik Willis. I don't see the Falcons trading up for anybody in a strap class. Uh, if they were going to trade up for anybody, it should be for a pass rusher. If you ask me, not certainly not for a quarterback. So um, we'll see if the Falcons take Malik Willis at eight. As I've said before, I wouldn't be necessarily a fan of that decision. I understand why the Falcons will take that decision uh, or make that decision. For me, that to me is more uh, an act of desperation in the Falcons wanting to put butts in the seats and, and energize the fan base and necessarily making the best football decision, in my humble opinion. But, you know, obviously other people will disagree. Obviously, you know, if the if Malik Willis is the pick, we will spend the next three months on this podcast me personally going on, you can go on my personal journey, follow me on my journey to, you know, talking with lots of people to convince myself that Malik Willis was actually the good pick. And by the time we get to, to July and training camp opens and we actually start to see him perform and play, you know, hopefully we can actually see him deliver on that promise and that potential and all those various things. And we can suddenly, you know, wrap our heads better around the pick at that point in time. So we'll just sort of have to see how it all plays out. I'm emotionally preparing myself to be disappointed, uh, basically, with the Falcons taking a quarterback at eight, which I think is likely to be Malik Willis at this point in time. Uh, our next question is from Brave Dirty Hawk. He asks, are we Chicago South now? And do you like deep dish pizza? So yes, clearly the Falcons are Chicago South because of, you know, the uh, incredible influence that Ryan Pace now has on all the Falcons roster moves with all the ex bears that we have been bringing into the building not only this off season but last off season. And to be honest with you, I've never had authentic deep dish pizza, um, you know. But I would imagine I would like it. You know, there aren't too many combinations of meat, sauce, cheese, and bread that are bad. So you know, it feels like whatever you know permutation and and whatnot that you combine those things into it will probably wind up tasting pretty good. So I imagine deep dishes, I would probably be a fan of it. Um, our last question comes from, you know, ATL Georgia changed my life. That's at Padre 1013 on Twitter. He asks, when does the hurting stop? And the answer to that is never, uh, if you're a Falcon fan. So, you know, sorry for the the darkness at the end of the episode. <laughs> you know, I've been a Falcon fan for 30 years. It, it hasn't stopped hurting yet. So, you know, hopefully – Hopefully it won't go for another 30 years, but, uh, you know, we'll get that Lombardi trophy at some point in time, hopefully in my lifetime. And that's when the hurting will stop, but, uh, doesn't seem like that's on the horizon anytime soon. So, uh, we'll just sort of to see how that goes. Appreciate everybody for sending in their questions last week and being patient with me to allow me to answer those leftovers 
on today's episode. Tomorrow, we'll be joined by Dave Choate, the head honcho of the Falcoholic. We'll get his thoughts on the Falcons draft plans and whatnot and their offseason moves. And we'll, we'll, we'll see if Dave has, you know, a short list of players that he's interested in the Falcons bringing into the building, as we've discussed with, you know, some of our previous guests on the pod and of course you know if you want to send in your questions for future q a's and mailbags uh you can do so via twitter at lockdown falcons via facebook at lockdown falcons you can send an email to lockdown falcons at mail.com or you can leave a comment here on the lockdown falcons youtube channel guys and if you want to get more insight into this upcoming draft of course the locked on nfl draft podcast has you covered on the same podcast platforms you can find locked on falcons including apple odyssey google spotify and youtube of course locked on nfl draft does their mock draft monday every single week as well as break down some of the top prospects and player rankings and get eric crocker and ryan tracy's uh in-depth insight into this upcoming 2022 nfl draft guys that's going to do it for us here i appreciate everybody that makes locked on falcons your first listen by all means recommend locked on nfl draft locked on braves locked on bulldogs locked on hawks Locked on Sports Atlanta as your second listen as you continue your wonderful Tuesday and or Monday evening, depending on when you checked out today's episode. Appreciate it, guys. Till then.